Welcome to all of you. It's nice to have you here. It's such an honor to do this with you. This is kind of a big deal. Um, I have to tell you that Daniela has nudged me to do this for a while. And I'll share with you my reluctance as we start to dig in a little bit. Right, Danielle? You can unmute, honey. <laughs> well, the first nut job move was me calling him some years ago, getting on her schedule, <laughs> saying, I'm <laughs> saying this to Cam, and, and I just, I don't know not to. So I'm like, oh, hi, I'm a complete nobody you don't, you've never heard of in your entire life, and I'm positive we're supposed to work together. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Like, I didn't, I didn't, I don't have that kind of visionary like Daniela does. So I'm kind of like, okay. <laughs> and Kim's work. And then I went on and, and participated in her um, eight week program, which is just life changing, game changing. And, um, you know, me, I'll, t I, I'll test it out first. I'll be the guinea pig in everything. And, um, it's, it's, uh, the, her work is, is revolutionary. Because for me, it answered all the, it answered the missing puzzle pieces. Like, why is it that no matter how much you process or talk through, dance out um, your stuff, it's like those last seeds just don't, are still around. And then something sprouts from it. I'm like, there's something missing in every model. And I've been on this journey consciously um, seeking understanding for, you know, almost 30 years. And, and I've been searching for that missing piece. And it was Kim's work that I saw uh, because it's complete. This process is a complete process, start to finish. And I have, and I've literally tested it all out, you know, whether it was EMDR to mushrooms to this, I'll lick a frog, I'll do, I'll do whatever once to see, well, does that work? You know, what does that do? Does that get at the samskara? Does that get at the root? And it wasn't until Kim brought it all together. Um, and also from her many, many years of, of being on the, on the journey with a, probably a similar quest, whether I'm sure it wasn't worded on her mental body in that way. And yet it's like, what? If there if there is suffering in life and there's a way there's a way through and out, I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna find it. So thank you, Kim. Thank you, Daniela. Such an honor. Thank you for always um pushing me into my growth space. Um yeah, pushing is like tech, you know, messaging her, like, how's the book going? That's pushing Kim. <laughs> Nudging. Checking <laughs> in. <laughs> To take me, to really have me bring this out further. Um, I'm just so grateful for the collaboration and for the support and for the love and for the fifth dimensional heart-based community that you create for all of us and that you create for me. I'm so mm, we love you. We're so grateful for you, Thank you. and with you. Thank you. Mm. So with that, you guys, we are all here from very different perspectives. Some of you are new on your path and are just getting started on your path of healing. Some of you are practitioners, yoga teachers, therapists who feel like there must be a more focused way to get to the root of anxiety and depression. Um, some of you just want to know what the hoopla is about. I don't know, <laughs> but know that we're all coming. And some of you have actually been through my work, level one, level two coach certification and level three healer certification. So, so we come from a wide range of backgrounds at, in relation to childhood trauma and the effects of childhood trauma, which are the vibrations that we call anxiety and depression. And I say that very mindfully because hopefully by the end of this program, 
you'll see that what you call anxiety based on the different layers of your body chiming and signaling in this way is very different than how someone else will call anxiety uh, because of certain things happening on their different layers of their bodies or within their different aspects of trauma stored in their body. So we use these blanket terms as if we're all talking about the same thing, but when we peel away the layers of the body, we start to recognize that um, there are just distortions. And as yoga would call it, the maya or the illusion that is distorting the truth of who we are at Ananda Maya Kosha, which is the bliss sheath or the bliss layer of the body, or more specifically, the connection and the integration of ourselves with our soul. Who am I? Um, so I grew up in a very dysfunctional family. Um, I had one parent with narcissistic uh, personality disorder. And so the experience growing up was that I could never be right. I could never do right. My truth really was always thwarted. There was so much control, not a lot of responsibility on that parent's end of things, a lot of blame onto, um, onto me. Now, I was the favorite, which everybody's jealous of that favorite kid, but I carried the burden of carrying that parent's happiness, okay? Being special is not necessarily uh, what it's cracked up to be. My second parent was a drug addict, alcoholic, um, and there was a lot of violence in my family, uh, attempted sexual abuse. And what that culminated for me is by the age of 13, when my family was going down and the divorce was happening, I developed depression and bulimia. And I was in this state for about two years um, until I basically got to the point where I realized that I was not on a good trajectory. Um, and luckily I had a vision of more for myself at that point. So I checked myself in to Four Winds Hospital in Saratoga Springs, and I spent 99 days inpatient getting treated for bulimia and depression. Now, unlike the rest of, of the people I was in with, I wasn't suicidal. Um, I actually had a really strong will to live, which is probably related to my solar plexus and all that fire I have. Um, but it was at that point at 15 years old that I basically made a decision like with my face over a toilet saying, this can't be the way that I live. And so something got activated within me, a decision at the soul level that said no more. Although I couldn't get myself out of it, which is why I did check myself into a hospital. And I'm, I can say that I was on Medicaid um, and was getting government assistance for that hospital stay. And it's one of, it's written in my book, and it's one of the greatest privileges I've ever had. Um, and I've been on my path for 31 years. I'm 46 years old since that point. And so when I got out of the hospital, I got kicked out of my house at 16 because I was too fiery and opinionated and um, it wasn't working out with my mother. And so I supported myself through my junior and sophomore, junior, senior year of high school um, and really just put myself through high school, put myself through college with this same desire and will to thrive. Mm -hmm. And I really participated in talk therapy from for those 10 years, basically from when I got out of the hospital till I was about 25 years old, traditional counseling. And then I found myself running eating disorder groups for my sorority at Syracuse University and um, volunteering at the church and becoming a Eucharistic minister and teaching Sunday school and just getting involved in, in spiritual community um, the best way that I knew how at that point, which was really between 17 and 21 um, is when my spiritual involvement came about. And then around 25, I started digging deeper into the introspective aspects of really looking at my thoughts and understanding myself with the mental and emotional analysis paralysis that we all get into. And that only took me so far. 
But my real healing started after 11 years of that mental and emotional introspection that I was doing. And it happened at 27. I was in Sedona, Arizona, and uh, my husband, I had never been to Sedona. And the night before, I like downloaded a, a painting of these red rock mountains, not even knowing, I know this is silly, that Sedona was full of red rocks. We went to Sedona and we went to a psychic because when in Rome, you know, and, um, and it was there that I went into the shaman. He was, he was a very old shaman. And he was like, was something here about children? And I'm like, no, nothing about children. And he's like, no, there's something here. And I was like, all right, whatever. Next thing you know, I'm in this really metaphoric journey and there's an eagle and we're going to save little Kim. And the whole time I'm laughing at this situation going, oh my God, this is so ridiculous. And, and, but I'm still doing it. And as I went and got little Kim, um, I just started breaking down crying and my, my nose started draining. And it was, I was like a big mess. I was a hot mess. My husband came after me and he was like, what did that guy do to you? And something happened or shifted within me. And it was, it wasn't even a, a, a really uh, extraordinary session. It was just something really hit me and I got a piece of myself back. And that night we went for a glass of wine and having been totally against having kids, Prior to this, um, we went and we made a baby that day. Um, and so I share that because uh, the kid came out with Sedona red hair uh, nine months later. <laughs> and on the plane ride home, we were like, whoa, that was crazy. We weren't going to have kids. Um, and I share that because of the magic, really the miracle of that experience, right? Like I went to a vortex, I went to a psychic, then went to a vortex in Sedona. And that night I'm pregnant with this kid who comes out with this auburn red hair. Like, okay, there's probably something there, right? Like there's probably, there was probably, that was probably a moment. Now at the time I wasn't spiritual really. Um, I, this was 18 years ago. I wasn't really in my spiritual path yet. Um, but something really awakened within me at that point. At 29, I found yoga and Ayurveda, which started to open up the energetic and physical connection to my inner work, which is a profound shift into those layers. And at 34, I had this really profound experience where a friend was dying of breast cancer and I was part of her, she called us her cancer posse. And I was pregnant with my third child and um, was just tending to her death. Really, she had stage four breast cancer. And it was after she died that something very strange happened to me. I was in bed. Um, first time I had ever known anyone that had died and a bat started swooping at my head and I went into the other room and I tried to get the sheet over my head and it followed me into the other room, which is kind of a benign experience again. But for me, it shook me down to the core because I felt like she was with me and I'd never really thought about the spirit world in that way. I had been involved in spiritual community, but I had never really thought of what was behind the veil. And so my spiritual work happened very quickly after that. I started asking the divine questions like, what exists? And is someone watching me? Does she know my thoughts? And who is God? And asking the big questions. And what I can tell you is if you sincerely and authentically start asking those questions and knocking at the door of the spiritual realm to say, hey, I need answers. I need to know. I need healing watch out because those requests are always, always answered. And for me, they were. And what happened from that point on was a rapid spiritual development. Soon after that, one of my first spiritual teacher came into town to do divine light work or whatever. I don't even know what that was. I was like, okay. And she spoke simply enough that it wasn't above my head and it wasn't even mental. It was seriously hitting me at the spiritual layer of my body. And so that experience was very profound and really opened me up. So here I am. I had stopped working with the, as a management consultant to the World Bank and the IMF by this point. And I was just a 
stay-at-home mom and my spiritual faculties were starting to open up with these with this five years of spiritual layer opening and it was really from that point forward when the spiritual um skills and intuition started to open for me that I started immediately filling my toolbox and developing processes um, to really bring healing out into the world. I was a psych major. I was going to become a therapist and last minute I went for a master's of public administration, probably to refine my business and hard skills so that I could do what I'm doing now as a healer, which is really pushing this material out into the world. So to watch those breadcrumbs is really magnificent from my perspective. So at that point, um, over the years, I became a yoga teacher, a meditation teacher, I started training, I became an Ayurvedic wellness counselor, a Reiki master, a soul retrieval healer, a violet flame teacher, I authored my first book about I don't know, five years ago, Awaken Your Potency, which was a spiritual book. And then I offer, authored my second book just last week on the inner alignment system that I've developed. So hopefully that's enough information about me. Hopefully that helps you understand that I've, I've been around the block and I've done my work and I've really worked these layers of myself. And in doing that work within myself and then doing it within my community in Saratoga Springs with all these willing participants who were ready to play with me with every download I was getting, I developed this three-level system, a two-month intensive healing process, a coach certification, and a soul retrieval healer certification. And so this system built itself it was in many ways just channeled through me because I was saying divine how do I help this person divine show me how to teach someone to do this themselves divine show me show me show me and when we develop that two-way communication with source energy or higher consciousness if we continue to ask if we beg hey I need the answers hey I need your help divine how do I help this person heal if we go and knock at that door, I assure you it's never not answered. The problem is that we may pull up and put our order in at the drive through but we may not stay long enough to pick up our order when it's ready being cooked. And that's one thing that I assure you will happen if you have a deep desire to serve, then if you continue showing up in your heart, with that desire, it will be done. Thy will be done. When we do trauma work, for those of us who have been on our path for a very long time, charging away, chipping at the iceberg, chances are we've healed some things. We may have rewired our mind and the way we think about things. We may have talked about our love languages with our partner and know that that person needs gifts and I need acts of service, right? Like we may have, we may have healed some things or found some sort of harmony in certain places of our lives. So in our work, we start with what's not working, what's not flowing, because at the surface, if we know what's not working and how it's not working and what happens when it's not working, then we can take those emotional reactions See, most of us are like, damn it, I'm having an emotional reaction and I wish I wasn't. When I have an emotional reaction, I'm like, yay, damn it again. Because the emotional reactions are like the flag at the top of the, of the you know, dirt right here. And it's the signal that there's some rabbit hole down here that hasn't been tended to, that hasn't been healed yet, that hasn't been worked through. So that flag, that signal from your body, whatever layer it's coming from, whether your physical body's in pain or whether you're having emotional reactions or whether you're really stuck on why this person couldn't have freaking done it the right way, <laughs> right? Like whatever is showing up as resistance, no matter what layer of ourselves that's happening, it's a signal for probably an old vibration that's reverberating into the present moment. So that list of what's not working is just a signal. 
it's just your, your car, the low gas light is dinging on your car, right? So you don't want to ignore that or make that go away or be like the damn car. You want to tend to that. You want to fill up the gas tank. The same is true with these current issues. We want to identify them. We want to see how things are showing up in the present moment so that we can tend to that. Now, the problem is that in the past, most of us didn't really know what to do with that. And so like unhooking the signal so it doesn't create an alarm anymore was our way of doing that or numbing with Netflix and food or distracting ourselves with Facebook or pouring ourselves into our children's lives so we don't have to think about our own lives, right? We have these coping mechanisms so we don't have to hear the dinging or the noise. But that just puts it off and it muffles the noise and makes it a little bit harder to identify it, that signal. So our work is to really just call a spade a spade and say, what's not working? And to dig in at every layer of the body to look at how we lost alignment with our soul in that specific aspect of our lives. And I know you're saying, but how do we do that? I'll answer that in due time. So let's begin now, shall we, with what is trauma? Well, if you read the book, (laughs) trauma, childhood trauma is the emotional, mental, physical, energetic, and spiritual response to an event or series of events, and we'll talk about that, which created fear, overwhelming fear, and an inability to cope during childhood, an inability to cope, an inability to make sense of what was going on, an inability to integrate what was happening in the experience as a child, okay? So that's how we define childhood trauma. It's something that happened at some layer of us. Someone said something, something happened to our bodies, something happened to our surroundings, something happens. And we're overwhelmed, not able to cope, can't make sense of it, can't understand it, can't even integrate the experience into some aspect of our thought paradigm or body paradigm. Most often, childhood trauma events are most difficult to process and integrate when there's not a loving adult caregiver present to help process what happened, to help integrate and understand, to bring comfort, to bring care, to support throughout that experience and throughout the aftermath of that trauma situation. So by this definition, there's a lot of things that could fall under the definition of childhood trauma, right? Someone saying something terrible to you on the playground and people laughing at you afterwards. Something as simple as the neighbors not including you. It could be uh, an experience at school where you got scared. It could be something that happened at home with a sibling, right? Benign, seemingly benign situations could fall under this experience. If you aren't able to cope or you're overwhelmed, you can't process it, you can't integrate it. Or if there's and or if there's no one there to help you process this experience and integrate it within your being. Okay, so we call this big T or little t trauma. Big T trauma is what you would define as trauma, right? Um, Alcoholism or or a a parent with a distortion or a mental health issue that really created difficulties within yourself, Um, rape, any physical abuse, any emotional abuse, neglect, over control, right? Those are all big T traumas. Everybody could be like, oh yeah, that's trauma. But the little T trauma, those smaller, less, less significant events are typically what we find in our work as the ones that are really stuck in keeping the wheel from moving. Isn't that fascinating? So someone with big T trauma might come to us. However, what's stored in there is often a little T trauma that felt like a very big experience. 
Another example of that is if someone is, for example, um, sexually abused. One would think it was the sexual abuse that was the loudest trauma vibration in the body, right? A big T trauma. But very often for these people, it was when they told their parent and their parent didn't do anything. That's the trauma experience. Still a big T trauma, but not the one you would think, right? So I just want to expand your definition of how we define childhood trauma because it's not as everybody thinks it is. It doesn't, there are a lot of people walking around with small t trauma who feel like I should be fine. I had a great childhood. I don't know what the hell's the matter with me. I hear that so often. And I think expanding our definition of trauma is a really important part of this definition. So childhood trauma happens between birth up until 25 years old. Why? Because we don't have a fully developed prefrontal cortex. We don't have a developed thinking brain to actually process experience and have like a thought paradigm in which to kind of integrate experiences. We don't have adult perspective until we're about 25 years old the early to mid twenties, if we didn't have trauma and if we had major trauma, then that could even be later because brain development is really affected by these adverse childhood events. So when we experience trauma as a child, it's important to think about how children experience life. I mean, think of children that are like running around with a knife or throwing a ball in a window or they don't understand cause and effect. They don't think about things before something happens. Something like running from a hug from someone and the person pushing you away can, can actually penetrate so deeply within a child because they don't understand why someone would push them away. Like they're coming from such pure essence, some such spiritually pure love open essence, every layer of themselves, super open. And this is straight up for many, many years. And if you preserve this, my children went to a Waldorf school that, that really preserved the senses and they're very mindful about what the children are exposed to. So at 15 years old, my daughter went into um, public high school in a different state. And she's just like an open sponge, like a dry sponge, ready to take everything in. And she hits a, 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 a suicide prevention week. And it, while they're just talking about what other kids have been exposed to their whole lives, she's just like, what? And she's taking it in. And by the end of that week, she was really like saturated. Like she took on everything. She could not process it because she had not built filters for that experience. It was, it was a trauma for her to experience that. And I'm not saying suicide prevention is bad. Please don't make up any assumptions based on anything I say, but I'm just sharing a personal experience that someone who, you know, is still open and taking everything in, not everything is to be taken in. So as children, experiences come straight into the body and penetrate our thoughts, our emotions, our energetics, our spirit, our soul, every part of ourselves can be affected very deeply by any experience we have. And I'm a parent who tried to prevent trauma and tried to prevent our, my kid from having an ego. And, and I will tell you, even though we're talking about trauma stuff and that we're talking about our childhoods as well, as a parent, there's no way to prevent a child from trauma in my experience. I mean, we'll do the best we can to, to protect them and to care for them, to help them process. But because the ego mind or because the rational mind, because the thinking brain is not fully developed, something can happen. And without the full capacity to process that, to understand it, it can be stored in a very distorted way with negative vibrations in the body. OK, so those of us who are perfectionists in our parenting, I will tell you, knowing this can help us be aware when our kid is hitting something that we wouldn't think would be a big deal. But to be aware, oh, you know, she could be proud. This could be traumatic for her. 
moving across country that my kids did. That was a trauma. It was a plain old trauma. So, so let's expand that definition and understand that children can fully experience trauma in every aspect of themselves. And this is what happens when we're young. So when that happens, this affects their nervous system physically on the physical layer of the body, the body can hit a fight or flight. So when, when the teacher laughs at the child in class, their child's nervous system goes into a full on fight or flight response, right? Emotionally, like you, this is the person that's supposed to keep you safe. So you feel like you're going to die. And that, that death fear is actually penetrates deeply into the body. And I'm going to define death fear a little bit later, but there is a fear, but a fear of, I'm not going to survive here. I'm not going to be okay. And that hits the emotional body as, um, as that deep fear. So remember, we said that anxiety, depression, anger, rage, those are all emotions, but underneath those emotions are probably a deeper seated fear. Mentally, when the teacher makes fun, the child might think, oh my God, I'm not safe, or I'm not smart, or I'm, st I'm stupid, or I should never have answered that question, right? There are thoughts that go along with that childhood trauma experience. Energetically, there are sensations, heart palpitations, flushing of the body on a physical level, but also like what we would call anxiety, right? The, the movement or like, or like a sensation of stabbing in the stomach or a feeling of heaviness that comes over. So an energetic experience happens during that childhood trauma experience. And at the awareness layer of the body, when you go through an experience, the animal brain is very active. The, the prefrontal cortex is not very active, right? And so, um, so the body goes into tunnel vision of like survival wired in tunnel vision. There's no uh, higher perspective. There's no greater perspective, which is like, I'm only in second grade. I'll get it later. I'll learn the math. I'll, I'll be able to live and pay for pay my bills, right? That's the awareness of the perspective, but that's not there for a child when they're going through that trauma in that experience. They're like, I'm going to die. I'm not okay. And, and that experience hits their awareness body. It goes, Whoo. and at a spiritual layer, most often during these trauma experience, there's not a lot of love present. There's not a lot of safety. The divine isn't there. There's no experience of the soul because the nervous system is so loud and the thoughts and the emotions. And there's this experience that's kind of fragmenting off during that moment. So I'm just trying to give you an example that every layer of our layer our, of our self has an experience during that initial trauma situation. Does that make sense? And apply any situation and we could go through what's happening in every layer of the body. Now, yoga says there's five layers because um, the emotional and mental layers, which are very intertwined, um, are considered the same layer of the body. But in inner alignment, we separate these out because the way we work with them is slightly different. Fear is at the seed, at the root of the thoughts and the emotions, right? But the way that we work with them, see them, and, and play with those layers of ourselves are different. So trigger warning, this, this picture may be offensive or may bring up some emotion for you. So if mom's yelling at me, ah, you should have done this. Why didn't you do this? And I'm just four, six, eight years old. I'm like, I love you, mom, but, but all I want is love. All I want to do is connect with my mom. All I want to do is please my mom. And this energy comes in and it's stored at the physical, the emotional, the mental layers of the body. It goes straight into the body and it's stored in the body. So if mom yells at me at six years old, those six-year-old thoughts 
those six-year-old emotions, the six-year-old consciousness of like, I'm not safe, we're not gonna be okay. The six-year-old nervous system response, a six-year-old separation from love gets frozen in that moment as a trauma packet and stored in a part of the body that corresponds with the chakra and the theme of what that person is working on in this lifetime. And this is where you'll get some scars come in, right? You can have two kids, you can have identical twins, the same trauma hits them, but where it gets stored and how it gets stored and how it reverberates in those two bodies are going to be very different based on that person's karma based on that person's life path, based on what that person's experience is and how they were processed, based on what that person's work is in this lifetime. We all have this. We all have something stored somewhere. Let's normalize that. Let's not make it bad. Let's not make it wrong. Let's not say, oh, let's get it out of me. Let's not do that. Let's just say, okay, there's something in there. There's some old thing from when I was six years old. I can't even know because the mental body can't access that deeply. So we don't know, but there's an old vibration. There's an old trauma packet frozen. And what happens is that frozen trauma packet will kick up in the present moment. It will activate in the present moment. And next thing you know, we're thinking I'm not safe and I'm not okay, and um, I, there, there's someone out to get me, or maybe I'm not good enough, or brrr, the trauma packet, which was old and lives in the past, is actually reverberating and still living in the body in the present moment, kicking up all kinds of thoughts and nervous system reactions, emotions, consciousness. We're basically where we have the six-year-old consciousness of mommy doesn't love me, reverberating in our 46 year old bodies. Now, I know you know that because every time I say that people are like, I don't understand that, but I know that that's true, right? Like some people can just be like, yeah, I've tried to get, I've tried to do everything I can, but just know there's old experiences living in the second dimension of your consciousness, very close to the body. So that's what we call a trauma packet. The trauma comes in, we have an experience, and because it's not processed, it's frozen and stored in a place within our body, concurrent with the chakra it's near. And so we take this on. And once it's in there, it's in there. It's in there. Which chakra does it get stored in? We're going to explore the energetic body next week, and we'll look at where your stuff got stored. We'll look at what patterns are showing up as a result of that. What thoughts are overlaying the present moment, triggering right up. So an experience with your dad is actually overlaying your experience with your spouse. And you're fighting for your life with your spouse. Won't you love me? Why can't you love me? The spouse is like, I love you. And then what happens through law of attraction is if I don't feel loved and I've got a trauma packet in my heart where love lives in the body, then the loudest vibration in my body is I'm not loved. I'm not loved. I'm not safe. I'm not loved. I'm not loved. I'm not loved. I'm not loved. So if that is your governing vibration and your governing thought, and your governing emotion, we call those the base vibrations. If that becomes your base vibration, then through law of attraction, what's gonna happen? Well, law of attraction and the law of resonance, law of resonance, law of attraction suggests like attracts like. So if I'm vibrating out unloved, unloved, ping, ping, unloved, then through law of attraction, I'm going to attract people who vibrate with that, which means they might never be able to love me. They may never be able to even reach me. It's like a repelling magnet. Do you know what I mean? Like you are like, I want love. I want a partner. I want a partner. And there's this like unloved, 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 unloved signal. 
right? And so through law of attraction, there's like a magnet. You know, when you put the opposite, the same ends of a magnet next to each other, they push against each other. So you may get a person to come into your life and you're like, great. And then for some reason, you can't maintain it. You can't hold the resonance of that love. Why? Well, if there's a trauma packet, if there are these loud base vibrations that are reverberating and replaying in your body, then chances are that like vibrationally, no matter how many positive affirmations and how much yoga and how much Kapalabhati breath you practice, those vibrations may be the loudest thing and therefore may attract those same types of situations. Now, what's very interesting as we start to go move deeper into this is that this vibration is stored in the body and then will replay. It's like there's a six-year-old part of you that's, that's parceled off trying to get the love. Trying just, if I could just get the love, if I could get the love, I could, if I could get the love, right? It's just, it's just over and over and over again, really replaying this unresolved thing, vibration in the body. And the more it replays, which it will automatically because it will trigger and continue, the more it wires into the body. And that's how it becomes the base vibration. It just gets replayed and replayed and replayed and practiced. And then the physical body will wire that in and the energetic body will get imbalanced to that space. And the mental body will develop belief systems around unloved. And the spiritual body will, will, will attract and will create that very experience in your body, which will separate you from the feeling of bliss and unity with your soul. So we're going to look a little bit more deeply at this. Again, this may be triggering to actually imagine that there are these experiences. And these are just examples, right? And it could be precognitive awareness that you're a baby and you were left in your crib all the time. And you, you and that experience of aloneness um, gets stored as abandonment in the sacral chakra. Or it may be that you got yelled at a lot, or there was an alcoholic that treated you negatively at night. And you may have wired and practiced a trauma packet of I'm bad. I'm wrong. I'll never be good enough. Or maybe everything looked happy and loving at home and everybody had smiles on, but you felt so such emptiness or unlove. And that got stored in your body. So different trauma packets will have different themes associated with them based on where you feel them in your body and where your experience is in your body. Now, our work is not to figure out what trauma packets in there so we can replay it, role play it, and work it in our mental body. Our first work is to bring awareness that there's these frozen replaying trauma packets happening and affecting every aspect of myself. And chances are, if I'm having emotional reactivity, it may be a signal that something old got activated and is replaying in the present moment. Okay. So Mandy's dad is angry after work and yells at her when she's four years old because she left a mess on the kitchen table. Physically, her body might go into fight or flight. Her nervous system might get activated. Her body might shake. She may have heart palpitations. She may stop breathing or she may have trouble breathing. So at the physical layer of the body, there are experiences that happen. Energetically, she may like go into a freeze response. She may then go into a freeze response and be like... <clears throat> and not be able to move. Oop, there's a typo. She may feel overwhelmed. She may feel like an energetic flutter in the chest. That's not the heart palpitating, but it's just like something in the energetic body of lots of movement. She may feel anxiety. She may flinch and be scared that she's going to get hit and emotionally feel unsafe or unloved. She may think, I'm a bad girl. I'm not worthy 
of dad loving me. I'm not, I'm not safe. I'm not worthy of that safety. She may believe that, um, that this is the only thing that's ever going to happen. She may feel so focused on this experience. And she may be so disconnected from her soul and the love and the beauty and the light and the gorgeous radiantness that she is. So this gets frozen in the body. It stays there for later processing. And we call this a trauma packet. Okay. So the thing about trauma packets is they stay in the space very close to the physical body and they're like a fire in the basement, just burning, making noise. This fire makes this kind of noise. This fire makes this kind of noise. And it, it smoke rises up into the upper layers of the house. So trauma is like a fire in the basement in the body. And this, and we feel the effects of that trauma. We feel the smoke building and building. And so it's not a bad thing to go do yoga or to go to therapy or to get some Reiki done to blow those smoke out of the upper floors of the house. That's how we can breathe, right? So no one's saying that's bad or wrong, but it's important to know that just because we do that, it doesn't mean that the fire is going to be put out. And I think that's what happens a lot. People are like, I've been on my healing journey. I've been blowing all kinds of smoke out of my house, but the fire's still there and I don't understand. Well, the fire's still there because there's still a trauma packet in the body. And no, the goal is not to sniff out every single trauma packet, get it out. And like, that's not the goal. The first goal is to just understand that this is a phenomenon that's happening within ourselves. Now, we may try to analyze it. We might listen to Abraham Hicks. We may um, go to therapy and talk about it. We may uh, do past life analysis. We might have our astrology read. Like, and all those things are great because it might bring some mental understanding and a map. But that only gets us so far. And that's happening from the, the attic looking down. So that's an important thing to know if you've done those things and you feel like all I do now is understand that there's a fire in my basement with a lot of smoke. Well, that's what building the mental and, and emotional awareness does. Okay, so it's important to know the effect of what's happening within yourself and be willing to blow the smoke out of uh, the body as well. So in my book, in that first chapter, I say that there are three things that you have to do. You have to change the vibrations within the trauma packet. And we do that through the inner alignment soul retrieval process. But ideally, you do this trauma packet work and then you sustain those vibrations in the body. Because if you don't, then you'll build new neural pathways and you start to build the pathways of feeling good. But because of what we know about the neuroscience of healing, those new neural pathways will truncate and you'll just feel the same way you did prior to the healing process. So we have to consider neuroscience when we're talking about emotional, mental, spiritual healing. And I think, you know, if when we look back at what causes trauma, it was the lack of the support, right? It was the lack of love. What is fear? Fear is kind of... Is, is the absence of being connected to the bliss body where the love lives within yourself. So we need to come back into love. And that's everything I do. My work is to bring back to love in the present moment into our hearts. Because if we can do that, then we can work with what's actually happening in the present moment, which as I said, isn't a whole lot, remember? So if Mandy's dad yelled at her, Right. And she stored all these trauma, all the trauma in the body and has these trauma packet that's kicking up. She may want to attract a boyfriend. She might more might want more love in her life. Right. But if her energies are imbalanced, she has she has vata imbalance, air imbalance in her constitution, and she has imbalances within her chakras, and she's got this re-traumatization through the reactivation of trauma packets, and she has emotional patterns of avoidance and isolation, she doesn't even want to put herself out there, and she believes that no one will ever love her, and her heart has been shut down, and walls are built up around her heart, and she's 
playing out karma of the lineage and ancestral patterns, and she feels unworthy, and she's fragmented off these trauma packets, these experiences of herself, so she doesn't feel the wholeness of her soul. And if her nervous system is in is highly activated with a fear response, and she's running these wacky relationship patterns from when she was six years old and she doesn't really like herself and she hasn't really stepped into what her soul is calling her to do and she has a lifestyle that throws her out of balance and she's totally disconnected from divine source. It's going to be pretty hard, right? Because the trauma and the trauma packets are creating resistance within all of these aspects of ourselves. Is it possible that a child can have trauma and be stuck at that age as an adult? Yes. Aren't we all? (laughs) Um, Why would a child um, during a trauma leave their body? So what happens during a trauma experience is the soul does pop out of the body during a trauma experience to, to help with the impact of the trauma. Um, And then often what will happen is people will feel dissociated, will feel like they're living outside of their body because they need to tether back in. Sometimes if there's a lot of drug addiction or alcohol abuse, or there's not a really good environment for the soul, a soul-based environment, um, then it will be hard for the soul to stay embodied. When we've done a lot of soul retrieval work with someone who's um, smoking marijuana all day, for example, we'll like we'll be five weeks in and be like, what's going on? Usually by now we know where they're supposed to be by five weeks. And then we'll find there was a secretive, you know, um, marijuana thing happening all day. And what, what happens is when we numb, when we get high, when we get real, when we get drunk, um, the soul pops out of the body during that point too. And then what happens is it becomes a breeding ground uh, for lower vibration. Um, so you can do soul retrieval and tether in, tether that soul back in. Um, but if there's any numbing or even recurring trauma, there may be that popping back out of self. Um, and then what happens in the cycle of of that type of addiction is then it feels so crappy because the vibration is so low because there's stuff in the energy field. We'll talk about this in the, in the fourth module. Um, so anyway, that's a long way to say that when someone's feel feeling outside of themselves, the soul does pop out of the body during trauma and may not, um, weave back in, um, now your soul is always there with you. The bliss body is always there. It's just, we're just talking about fragments or like little kinks. You know, if you have a kink in your spine, you can't bring the kundalini up. And I think of it in that same way. It's like there's just a kink, so the the river can't flow. That was a lot, huh? I'm a lot. You know, when you go around feeling like I'm too much for people, I'm too much for people, and I'm okay with that. And we're going to work with the shadow aspects, too, of all of these aspects of ourselves. So thank you for being with me on this journey today to start digging into all of these juicy concepts. 